I was asked to talk about frustrated magnetism in one dimension, and I kind of assumed that there was going to be a talk on frustration in two dimensions, because frustration is really, mo most of the action is taking place in two and three dimensions. And I realized, no, nobody is talking about frustration at all. So I cannot possibly give a talk on frustration without giving some background and some ideas in two dimensions that might be relevant. So I changed a little bit the topic of my talk, and uh, the very nice dinner yesterday and the very nice uh, German wine helped preparing <laughs> a talk last night. So I hope you will enjoy it. I will, not, I will not go through all the list of the people. I've worked with a lot of theorists that at some point were in uh, Lausanne, but I've also worked a lot with the experimentalists. Uh, yes, it works. In, uh, uh, in Japan, in Kashiwa, with Masashi Takigawa and with the high field uh, NMR group in uh, Grenoble. And uh, a number of experiments I, I will show have been uh, uh, made in collaboration with them. So the scope will be, as I said, some introduction to uh, uh, frustration. And then some discussion of frustration in two dimensions because it contains some of the most interesting ideas in the field. And also some phenomena and some effects that might actually be relevant for the community of ad atoms. And uh, uh, I'm not the only one. I mean, I, I tested this idea yesterday discussing with Christian and other people. And we came to the conclusion that indeed maybe there is something to do there. So that could be interesting. And then I will turn to what I was supposed to talk about, frustration in one dimension, which uh, has a number of uh, exotic properties that I will hopefully describe if time allows. So let's start. Uh, um, the first part of the talk will deal mostly with the Heisenberg model. Heisenberg meaning that we will have only S dot S interaction, no biquadratic or other interaction. This will come later in the talk. And also no anisotropy. And of course, in the context of this conference, this is a, uh, uh, some kind of a limitation we will have if, we, if there is really something to do uh, at, at the uh, intersection between the two communities. We will have to think about how much of the physics that I'm going to talk about will, uh, will uh, uh, extend to situations where we have anisotropy, because anisotropy, as I understand, is uh, present when you put atoms on a surface in most cases. So if we start from this very general Heisenberg model, the two uh, well, very well identified paradigms there are, first of all, long range magnetic order. This goes back to Neel in, uh, in the 30s, that uh, system can develop some kind of uh, long range order, in which case we have uh, uh, low lying excitations known as spin waves. And this will, only, this will be in particular true for square lattice or cubic symmetry. But another situation, and that is a little bit more recent, that actually goes back to the spin one chain and more recently to ladder, is the case where, because of some uh, 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 effective reduced dimensionality, the system has a spin gap. The ground state can be thought of as a product of singlets. Here in the ladder, you could put singlets on the rung. And to make an excitation, you have to promote the singlet into a triplet. And uh, this costs an energy. This energy will be reduced by J. But in this particular geometry, for instance, uh, however, be, however large J might be, the system will always have a gap. So this is a very rob robust feature. And uh, in that case, of course, there are no low-lying excitations, spin excitations, because there is a spin gap. So with these kind of ideas in mind, you can understand really a lot of uh, uh, the physics of quantum magnetism, but not everything. And uh, uh, not everything because all systems are not that simple, and the complexity, the geometrical uh, complexity, can uh, uh, lead to new physics. So I, I uh, drew a small picture in the to, to fit with the context of this conference. Imagine you put atoms on a, on, on a, sur on a surface. Uh, uh, the most simple uh, thing you can do, the simplest thing you could achieve is to have a chain, so you put atoms one near the other, and to a good approximation, you can expect the coupling to be only between nearest neighbor. So in the context of a Heisenberg model, this is the spin chain, which could be what, spin one half, spin one, or whatever, depending on the atom. But now, if your chain, for some reason, for because it wants to sit at different sites or other reasons, if your chain adopts such a geometry, then you still have coupling mostly between the nearest neighbors, but then uh, you have a nearest neighbor for one atom, but another one which is not too far. And in fact, as you, well, as you know, the coupling depends a lot on actually the, uh, uh, the geometry of the orbital. So you, you, you might, it might be a better starting point to have a model with two coupling constants. And uh, if you're dealing with a super exchange, at least in most cases, these coupling constants will be antiferromagnetic. So that's a very common situation as well. Why is it called frustration? 
And uh, uh, it's called frustration because in, uh, uh, it is impossible if you have antiferromagnetic uh, uh, couplings and uh, loops with an odd number of bonds to satisfy all bonds simultaneously. If you're on a, uh, on a square lattice, you can have all bonds antiferromagnetic, and this is a very robust starting point that will resist quantum fluctuations, <coughs> except in one dimension. But uh, uh, if you have uh, uh, a triangle or odd loops uh, in general, then once you've satisfied one bond, you cannot satisfy both bonds simultaneously. This is, in fact, competition, it's, uh, uh, but it's uh, uh, a common definition also of frustration in that context, a competition between exchange paths. So, very clearly, it's not completely, it's not obvious then what the starting point could be. And this very simple fact has very deep consequences that are still being worked out. The community of quantum magnetism is far from having solved the, some of the very simplest problems in the field. It's still fiercely debated, like the Kagome I will discuss in a minute. So, uh, it's not, this very simple looking problem turns out to be extremely hard. So what are the possible consequences? This I can discuss, it's easy enough. The first one has been discussed previously already in the talk by uh, Stefan Blügel, it's helical long-range order. It's even a theorem. If you take uh, a classical spin on a Brave lattice with one side per unit cell, you can minimize the classical energy by a helical configuration. It's, uh, this is uh, simple. It doesn't mean that it is the only ground state, that's an important uh, co corollary. So very often you can have the different helical states that you can combine and still having other solutions, the family of solution, the square lattice with the next nearest neighbor coupling is a typical example. But still, in most cases, if you synthesize a, a system described by Heisenberg model, you're going to end up having some kind of helical long-range order at very low temperature. That's the most common situation. To avoid this, at least in dimension two and three, because in dimension one I will come to it, quantum fluctuations are anyway very big, but in two and three dimension, if you want really to, uh, to expect to find new physics, you have to fight against this tendency to make a helical state, an ordered state, very clearly. And one way is just to look for systems where the ground state is not unique. So, you, you, you can find this situation already on Brave lattice when different helical states could combine. But on non Brave lattice, such as the Kagome and the Parochlor, this, uh, uh, th this is a very clear situation. I will give an example on the Kagome. And once you've gotten rid, of, uh, gotten rid of this tendency to make a helical state, then you have many ground states, quantum fluctuations are enhanced, and you can hope to find new physics can find some examples possibly of resonating valence bond spin liquid. But all, all these are quantum spin liquids or algebraic spin liquids that are gapless but still do not have long range order. And uh, this is what is being worked out by the community at the moment. There is progress, some specific models, and, uh, but still I would say a lot of activity to be anticipated for at least the next decade. And uh, uh, we, 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 we definitely need experimentalists to tell us the solution, to tell the truth. And, then we'll be able to justify it. It's an extremely tough problem. And then frustration, this is almost a side uh, effect. If you put a frustrated magnet in a magnetic field, it gives another interesting thing. It gives magnetization plateaus. The equivalent of MOT insulating phase in MOT transition, these are incompressible states of matter. And this is, there are some examples, and this is a, a, a domain where the kind of experiments that are possible on a surface might really have something to say. So I will now briefly discuss one example so that to, to put some, uh, um, to, 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 to give you some example of, of the, uh, 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 what I mean by infinite degeneracy, and then I will discuss magnetization plateaus to try and motivate you to maybe look at uh, this problem. So let's look at one of the paradigms in the domain of frustrating magnetism. This, the name Kagome was uh, pronounced at least by uh, uh, by Professor Wiesendanger on the, uh, on the first day. He had a small Kagome lattice, which was actually David Starr, only uh, six triangles. So the Kagome lattice is shown here. It can be uh, looked in different ways. It can be looked at the triangular lattice depleted, where on every second row you remove half the spins. It can be looked at as a corner sharing triangular lattice, or you made as you know, overlapping David stars. And the peculiarity of that system is that at the classical level, you can minimize the energy in an infinite number of ways. And in, in a huge infinite number of ways. Why? Because of the following. 
in fact, to minimize the energy, a uh, sufficient condition is uh, to minimize it on each triangle. So if you can minimize the energy separately on each triangle, you will have minimized it on, minimized it on all the lattice. Now, to minimize the energy on triangle, you just have to ensure that the sum of the spins is zero. This is very simple because the sum of s dot s is proportional to the square of the total spin. And this, it turns out, can be done in many ways. So even if you try to, uh, uh, to uh, um, restrict yourself to coplanar configurations, like here, uh, this can be done in an infinite number of ways. In fact, once you have chosen the orientations of the spins on uh, uh, one triangle, all you have to do is to make uh, a mapping of the system where on each triangle, each color appears once. It's the same degeneracy as the three-state POTS model, and this has a residual entropy, an infinite degeneracy. So it's because the system is not constrained enough. If we had the site here, triangle, then once we have put spins on one triangle, the whole lattice would be filled. But here, the constraint that we triangles share only one site is uh, too weak to ensure a, a, a proper order. So we have, in any case, at least a discrete degeneracy among all the pot states. But it's worse than that. On this particular example, I mean, it's, uh, it has, it's not speci uh, very specific, but it has something here that around these triangles, all the spins point in the same direction. And that's such loops or lines will occur uh, whenever you take a random state of the three-stage post model, you will find such loops. Then you can still continue to satisfy the constraint uh, uh, that uh, the sum of the spin is zero on each triangle. If you turn all the spins inside here, red and yellow, around the common direction of the green spins. But by doing that, you create non-coplanar configurations. And these configurations depend on a continuous angle. So you have a huge infinity of ground states. This is a system where the tendency to have magnetic ordering is as weak as it can be. Because the system, in principle, could choose between many, many different states. And it, uh, in fact, if you look at uh, uh, um, uh, um, fluctuations, Gaussian fluctuations around the ground states to try to select states, it doesn't work. All these states at the harmonic level, all the coplanar states still have exactly the same zero point energy, regardless of the uh, ordering. So it's a very, the system is very resistant to ordering. So that's a typical example where we can expect other physics to occur, in particular for the, the quantum case of spin one half. So that's a well defined question, in principle, a simple problem. And uh, after 25 years of uh, extremely hard work, there is no consensus in the community. There are indications, so there are, I would say we are slowly converging towards two, uh, two schools, the RVB school and the algebraic spin liquid school. The RVB school, I will, I can give a, 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 a small cartoon. The RVB school goes back to an idea, an old idea of uh, uh, Anderson that was put forward for the triangular lattice in 1973 and then brought back again in the context of HTC in 1987 uh, as a possible ground state in a spin liquid ground state that would give rise to superconductivity. And the basic idea is that the, for the system, since long range order is not favored, you cannot decide, you would lose too much by adopting one state. Somehow for the fluctuation, it's better maybe to, uh, uh, to bind sites into singlets, neighboring sites into singlets, this is almost an eigenstate, but you have defect triangles. If you look at it, you know, whenever you have a singlet in front of a single side, this is an eigenstate. But then you have situations where this is no longer possible. And here, I would have a dimer coming here, and this triangle would not be satisfied. So this is not a bad starting point. But any singlet configuration breaks the translational symmetry and possibly also the rotational symmetry of the system. So one way to restore all symmetries, because the ground state doesn't break the rotational symmetry, is to make a linear combination of them. This is an RVB state, the cartoon picture. You just make the sum of all possible wave functions by uh, corresponding to dimer coverings. And this is probably a good variational basis for the system, but whether the ground state still has the property, there, there, are, there would be some topological properties attached to this. Whether the ground state of the Kago may satisfy this or not is still under question. The, uh, um, some recent, uh, well now already four years old, uh, simulations by Steve White and collaborators suggested that this is indeed the case, that the system has a gap to triplet excitations, but also a gap to singlet excitations, as an RVB state should have. 
But I, I think this is still discussed by other groups now, and it's, uh, it's becoming more and more uh, uh, obscure, actually. The other school has it that it could be an algebraic spin liquid, that you should think of the system rather in a fermionic language, and that the system would have a, a not a Fermi surface, but would have a spectrum, which is a Dirac spectrum, and uh, uh, that the Dirac spectrum nature of the system that would be filled up to the uh, Dirac points would give an algebraic liquid. This turns out to have a very good uh, variational energy, and uh, uh, this is possibly, uh, this is another candidate, and that's, uh, at the moment, that's where it is. So I could continue to discuss in more detail this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of physics. The thing is that these spin liquids, even in uh, uh, condensed matter in bulk materials, are very difficult to probe, because this is end of no order. Yes? Is it clear that both of these are some kind of state of the Kagome limits, and that you just have to figure out which one is lower in energy, or are there some situations, like are there some assumptions where one would be right, but the other would not be right? No, these are just ansatz, variational states, wave functions proposed. It's, it's in the context of, uh, you take your imagination, there are other, other states. When I say an algebraic spin liquid, in fact, there are many wave functions, and one of them is lower. That's in, the, in that, uh, in, in, in that uh, context. Because the numerical simulations are just not able to, to really answer, that's and the problem. What, just going back to some of the themes we've talked about here, what is the difference between the infinite lattice and a finite lattice? And how big does it need to get before it starts looking like this rather than sort of one triangle or two triangles? So it, it, uh, as a general question, I would say the answer is that uh, the boundary conditions matter a lot. If you, if you have open or closed boundary conditions, you can have edge states. Uh, you can e even control the, 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 the physics if you take some states depending on the number of sites in one dimension. It, it matters a lot. So for the Kagome, w w whenever we talk about uh, systems here, we have in mind infinite system because we have in mind crystals. So what we do is we basically never work on an open a system with open boundary conditions, unless we have to for technical reasons like the MRG, we try to work on a torus as big as possible to be representative of the infinite system. But the, 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 the periodic conditions indeed to can, can alter the physics or control even the physics quite a bit. So to probe no, this spin liquid so is very difficult. Yeah, yes? Well, it, you didn't quite answer the question. I mean, we cannot ah. work on an infinite torus yes. uh, in the STM. So, so the, the question remains how big should we make it? So like five of these units or ten, or when, when will the edge effects become not dominant? I, there, there is a, uh, I, I can, uh, um, it, it, if, if depending on the size, you're going to observe different physics. Imagine that for the spin one half Kagome antiferromagnet, you work with the David star, which is represented here. Yeah. I can't write down the ground state exactly. Yeah. If you take a product of singlets on all these bonds here, one, this is an eigenstate and this is the ground state of the system. Because the system is so small that you haven't reached a point where this construction doesn't work anymore. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, so if you were to work on this system for quantum spin one half, the ground state would be a simple, it would be twofold degenerate because there are two such states. Yeah. It would be very much like the frustrated spin chain. Now, so you would have at least to have two David stars to start frustrating the system and making this, uh, this construction uh, 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 this construction uh, impossible. And, uh, uh, but then if you work on a finite system, on, on, on a lattice, then you should really, you, you should not expect to find the answer to what the ground state is and the excitations in the literature that is dealing with very big systems. Mm -hmm. You should do calculations for finite systems because the finite size effects and open boundary conditions will be very big. You will see trace of, of, of the physics. You might, be, you might be able to see whether the, the ground state is more consistent with one or the other. But uh, the spin liquid... So, so would the answers that we would find experimentally in something this small still be of use to the people who do calculations on the infinite system? Um, uh, if it is too small, and if it is a spin one half, we can't do the calculation exactly. Yeah. So I think the system should be big enough that you're not able to do the calculation 
if you, I mean, it, this goes back to a question that was asked yesterday, I think. Why, why do you do that? We know what a spin one chain is, we know the edge states. What do we, I mean, first of all, the technological you know, breakthrough to measure this would be remarkable to, for Earth theories. I mean, I, I think the question of whether we understand or not. But here, if you want to have uh, 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 an answer that, that could be of uh, uh, some interest, the current record, I think, for exact diagonalization on the Kagome is 48 sites. So you should have a system which is bigger than 48. And if 48 you David stars or 48? No, no, 48 <laughs> sites. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, 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 48 sites. No, no. You know, exact diagonalization, you know, the Hilbert space is 2 to the power of the number of sites. So uh, okay. you, 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 that's, spin that's spin one half. So you reduce the, the Hilbert space by using symmetries, but typically you can do small systems. So, and for spin one, the system are smaller. The bigger the spin, the smaller the system. Now, for 48 spins, is that considered close enough to the infinite limit to learn something? Or are you still thinking you're stuck in the finite <sighs> You're, you're asking a difficult question because to, to give you the answer, I should know, first of all, the answer of 48 sites, which in principle I can, but we have the energy, but not even the wave function. And I should know the physics in the thermodynamic limit yeah. to tell you. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's an organic process. If people start to do it, I'm sure we're going to learn something. But if I was able to tell you what we will learn, I would already know it somehow. That's, that's actually already, that's already a good answer. Yeah, so it, the if someone is ready to put the Kagome, I, you contact me, I will answer, no problem. <laughs> Even if it is, you know, 36 sites, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Whatever you can do, so no, no problem. But this physics is, is, is not understood. And if it is uh, some kind of spin liquid, what you're going to see, that's another problem. We have, this is what I was going to say before the questions were, were asked. Even in bulk materials, if it is a spin liquid, it doesn't break any symmetry. It's almost like a vegetable. What do you see? So it's a real problem to know what to see, some you know, topological degeneracy. It, it's, it, it's, a, it's a field in itself, you know, first of all, to find systems that are quantum liquids and then to, to probe them. But they can but see if there is a gap or not. The, the gap, the, these questions, yes. You know. if, if you wanted to, dis to, to, to distinguish just between these two possibilities, I agree, that's, that would be enough. And if it is not an RVB, but if it's a valent bond solid, there should be a broken symmetry in the ground state. But if it is an al algebraic liquid, it becomes a little bit subtle. You, you would, should measure correlations in the ground state. I mean, there are possibilities. It, it, it would be gapless and then in correlations, you would have no bracket peak, but some divergence and uh, some signatures. But on a finite system, if you have no magnetic field, in, and if that's the system, I, uh, I haven't thought enough about it, maybe, but it, it's not obvious what you're going to see. What, what is more uh, 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 directly accessible and still of great physical interest is what happens in a magnetic field. Because in a magnetic field, you expect to have some signatures that are accessible to local probes, and some questions in the field are still open the way the, Kagome, uh, the ground state of the Kagome is. So let me go briefly about the magnetization of uh, antiferromagnet. See, time is running, but I, anyway, I can stop anywhere in the talk. It doesn't matter. It's a mm -hmm. different subject. So if you uh, start from the, uh, go back to an AL system, very simple system, and put it in a magnetic field, if it is, uh, uh, if it is really isotropic, uh, small field, the spins will go perpendicular to the field and tilt, they will tilt sli slightly towards the field. And uh, uh, the, the, the classical magnetization curve is a straight line, in fact, up to saturation where the spins have ultimately reached the position where they are all along the field. And if there is no frustration, quantum effects do modify this curve, but not in, a, a not in a drastic way. There is still a finite slope, a susceptibility, and then there is a slight curvature. And here there is a zero temperature a logarithmic singularity. The slope is infinite and the before it reach, reaches saturation, but it's almost the same. So this is not so interesting. This has been actually uh, calculated with quantum Monte Carlo, measured in some systems, and uh, it's very difficult to make sure that it's logarithmic here, but the overall agreement is very good. Now, frustration brings something qualitatively new there in, in, in that context. And uh, the first example was uh, uh, on the triangular lattice. If you take the triangular lattice in, uh, 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 in zero field, the ground state is unique up to a uh, uh, global rotation of the spin. So, uh, uh, and it's a three sub lattice order, it's a helical state. The triangular lattice is a Bravais lattice, so we have a 180 degree state. 
Now, frustration becomes more interesting when you put the system in a magnetic field, because in a magnetic field, the ground state is infinitely degenerate again. And it's a little bit tricky to see, so I will just discuss two families of state. One family of state is the same as for the nail state, where the spins tilt slightly towards the field, all by the same angle. You can minimize the energy in a field in this, with this configuration, but there are also planar states. Planar states where, uh, with, in a plane that contains the magnetic field. So in fact, there are also classical states that minimize the energy where if the field in this direction, two spins point towards the field and one spin points exactly opposite to the field. It's, uh, and there are, there are families of states that uh, interpolate between those umbrella states and those planar states. So we have a whole family of states and we are back to a frustrated situation where for classical spins, the system is not sure what to do. So the first thing that was uh, uh, worked out for thermal fluctuations and also for quantum fluctuations is that among all the states, the planar, planar states are favored by fluctuations. That's kind of a general a trend that uh, uh, the systems that are planar or tend to be collinear have a softer spectrum and so they minimize the, uh, the zero point energy. So in fact, if we were to look at the uh, just uh, uh, s very slight uh, fluctuations, we would expect a magnetization curve which is still parallel and which have these states. But there is here one special state which is collinear. On the way to polarization among the planar state, one of them is collinear it's a structure with two spins up and one spin down. And again, there are different arguments, but this structure is more stable somehow than the neighboring structures, because the, the spectrum is even softer. And in fact, you expect this structure to be stabilized in a field range, so that the, uh, the magnetization curve of the triangular lattice for uh, any spin which is not infinite, not classical spin, is expected to be something like this. This is an old plot taken from the uh, seminal paper in the field by uh, Shubukov and, uh, and Golosov. So the magnetization is going to increase up to a certain uh, value, exactly one third. And in a whole field range, this state up, up, down is going to be stabilized. So the structure is expected to be something like this. And there, for instance, the question that you were asking about the shape of the crystal is very important because if you take a finite sample of the triangular lattice, I suspect that there, maybe there are deviations, we should be careful about that. But depending on the shape of the lattice, the system is going to adopt an up-up-down configuration whereby it maximizes the number of up spins. So the magnetization will be slightly larger possibly than, uh, than one third. And so this will fix one of the uh, uh, three possible states if there is one that maximizes the number of up spins. So you can expect to have, in real space, a structure that has a pattern with up and down spins. And if I, as I understand the, the, the current state of the art of experiments, it is possible to detect the orientation of a spin. So that should be something very, very simple. What is more difficult, I suppose, is to, uh, uh, to simulate or to, to uh, uh, realize a system that is isotropic, that has a Heisenberg model, has a, uh, the, because there will be some anisotropy. So uh, th this actually <coughs> remains true even with some level of anisotropy. There would be work to do. But this is typically the kind of question that could be, uh, uh, that could be advertised. So if someone is, is willing to give it a try, I think the triangular lattice is really the uh, most robust <coughs> plateau in, uh, in, uh, uh, that is known. It's a very stable one. It has a one-third uh, uh, up-up-down structure. And uh, uh, in fact, we know of bulk uh, materials that represent this. There is an, uh, an iron system, spin five half, which has a, a, a tiny one third plateau. The plateau width goes to zero with the magnitude of the spin. And, uh, for classical spins, there, there would be a plateau? No. For classical spin, there would be no plateau at zero temperature. There would be a plateau at finite temperature. Because again, thermal fluctuations, but then uh, the plateau is going to be smooth, but thermal fluctuations tend also to create some, some plateau, but qu quite small. I think it's better. But for quantum spins, you see already spin 5 half, which is a large spin, it is really thin, it's uh, at low temperature, and for spin 1 half, the plateau is really, uh, is really uh, very big. It, it's, uh, uh, if you had a coupling of 50 tesla, the plateau is several tesla uh, wide. So, of course, I mean, you don't want 50 tesla, I suppose you would like to have smaller couplings. Uh, I'm sorry? You, 
you could do a spin chase already to see this plateau. Yeah, so you could do a spin one, uh, a J1, that's correct. A frustrated J1, J2 spin chain would also see a plateau. That's correct, you, you're right. The, uh, yes, you, uh, the plateau is a little bit smaller. I mean, I don't know. You could do a ladder. I'm going to show a ladder. There are several systems, yes, where, where the plateau could be, uh, could be observed. You're, you're absolutely right. The triangular lattice is just a very simple type of up up down structure in real space and uh, um, that you could observe. So there are all other, other systems. This field of magnetization plateau is even a big system and now I will briefly describe to you some open questions in the field where uh, uh, help is needed from other communities maybe to answer. Because wh what I showed before was a system that is classically ordered. We have many classical states. One is favored and the collinear state is stable. But we can also have other systems, and they were discussed earlier this week by Thierry Jamarki, particular spin ladders. A spin ladder is a collection of, a, uh, of uh, uh, dimers. If we have a single dimer, we put it in a field. The ground stage is a singlet. And uh, one of the triplets uh, 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 has an energy that goes down linearly with the field. So there is a crossing point where the ground state becomes the triplet polarized along the field. And if you couple these objects, you expect to have a magnetization curve that has this form. This is a Luttinger liquid in Thierry Jamarki's uh, language. And he has discussed this quite a lot and the number measuring the exponents and so on. From our point of view, we are just looking at the magnetization and this magnetization was measured in that system, for instance. I think that was the first measurement where the magnetization is zero because there is a spin gap in the system, but then it raises more or less linearly and the temperature is not low enough to see the, the, uh, uh, the logarithmic, the, the, the square root singularities in 1D. Now if you put frustration in the system, it was realized early enough uh, 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 that uh, uh, this is a different situation where we can have a plateau. So that would be an example in, in one dimension. Frustration here is introduced by making some diagonal coupling here. So again, we create uh, loops of uh, uh, odd lengths. This model, then the, 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 uh, the, the system can be mapped onto a, a Handcore boson. Thierry Jamarki explained that in his talk. That's exactly the same thing. It said that the kinetic energy, if we have frustration, is proportional to the difference J minus J prime. We have the potential, the repulsion between nearest neighbor uh, uh, is the sum of J over J prime over two, the average value. So that we have a system when we increase frustration that has a very small kinetic energy, a big repulsion, and there is a multi insulating phase in the language of fermions or hardcore bosons, which corresponds to a plateau. So there is a prediction that that system will have a plateau if J prime over J is not too small or too large, but uh, around one, in fact, between one third and three to first order in perturbation theory. And the, uh, uh, this was confirmed by DMRG simulation. So the ground state of that system is again, a system where we, it's no longer an up, up, down structure we will have singlets, so we will have spins pointing up. Every other rung has two spins pointing up, and every other rung is a singlet with a zero magnetization. And there are two ground states here, but if you work on a finite system, for instance, if you had a system of 10 spins like this, surely enough, in a magnetic field, you would have, in the intermediate regime, three dimers being in the up-up direction and two of them being singlets, and this should have a very clear signature in a, a system. This is a rather simple geometry, but uh, nature is not uh, nice to us. It hasn't given us a system with, uh, 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 with this uh, topology, but it has given us another system, which is, in fact, more interesting. It's uh, very much the same kind of idea. It's a, it's a two-dimensional kind of analog. It's a system where, layered system, where we have copper layers separated by strontium layers, the copper here are in red, and they make an orthogonal dimer lattice. It's a very topologically simple lattice. Put a dimer, four neighbors are perpendicular, all neighbors are perpendicular to each other. And in this situation, it's very special because the ground state here is such that if you make dimers everywhere, it is an exact ground state. You know, the construction for the Kagome that worked for David Starr <laughs> stops working at some point because of some constraint. But here, if you put singlet on all these bonds, this is a ground state. So you expect the system to have a, a big spin gap, but also it is very frustrated because we have triangles. So the model actually goes under the name of the Shastri Sutherland model, because if you pull it a little bit, you realize it's like a square lattice with some diagonal couplings, and this lattice 
was investigated in uh, 81 by uh, Shastri and Sutherland, who realized what I said, that the, ground, the product of singlets on J-bonds is always an eigenstate, and it will be the ground state provided J prime. The coupling between these objects is not too large, but the actual limit is 0.675 according to recent numerical work. So we can couple them quite a bit. And the interest in that system and the mystery comes from the measurement of the magnetization curve. And uh, the several groups have measured and uh, several theoretical groups, but uh, at the moment I think there are two teams in the world. One is in Los Alamos and the theorists are here in the room. <laughs> Adrian and, uh, and Christian, and the other team is in Japan and the theorist is uh, here. So we are uh, uh, collaborating, competing, we have different views. It's, it's very interesting because we still, there are a lot of mysteries. Let me show you. So the first, the first data, the first report, there is something bizarre and that system came from Japanese paper and uh, it was measured by Kageyama and collaborators. They were looking for a measurement of the uh, 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 of the spin gap in the system. So the spin gap is measured by the critical field where you start to polarize the system. They did this, this is pulse, pulse field, it's already quite high field, up to 45 Tesla. And they realized that there are anomalies. And they call these anomalies plateaus because they are clever people. They knew what they were doing. It doesn't look at all like a plateau, but uh, the next set of measurements, it really looked like a plateau. They were right. So they measured the first two plateaus. And then it was another plateau at one third was found, and this started to look more like a plateau at one eighth and one quarter. These are different field orientations. And for a while, this was the picture, three plateaus, one over eight, one quarter, one third. This is where the Los Alamos group entered the game, measured the uh, magnetization, realized that there are a lot of oscillations between what would be one over eight and one quarter. And uh, well, I think we, uh, I think now we agree that maybe the interpretation was not uh, uh, very accurate. They came up with a series of plateaus, but very clearly they were the first to realize that there is some action taking place between that plateau and that plateau. A steady field experiment done in Grenoble in the high field realized that now seems to, come to came to the conclusion that there are actually plateaus at one over eight, two over fifteen, one over six, one quarter. Sounds to be bizarre. The Salamos group came again with another measurement. Many restrictions, they went to very high field. They, 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 they beat the, the record of uh, 100 Tesla. So the 100.75 Tesla. It's not measurement of magnetization, they measure the magnetic restriction. But anyway, they realized that there is something here that probably is the beginning of a one half plateau. They confirmed there is a very broad one third plateau and they found an anomaly here that uh, uh, they interpreted as a two fifth plateau. Then the Japanese group came up with another technique <laughs> and they went up to 118 Tesla. Mm. And uh, 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 so, what they confirmed, so, I mean, of course there are things, but this is done in steady field, but the pulse field, now you're talking about experiments where uh, uh, here you destroy the coil, but still, if you're lucky, you don't destroy the sample. That is, the coil, coil explodes, <laughs> but the sample and the, and the cryostat are still okay <laughs> most of the time. Well, the previous experiment, I think, is non-destructive. You yeah. don't destroy it. It's a big, big coil and you, you send current. So now you start the, the real most destructive experiments and the next level goes to a few hundred Tesla, destroy the coil and the, uh, and the sample. And the next level, which is not done anymore, destroys the lab. Also, <laughs> so it was done in the <laughs> desert in Los Alamos. So it's, uh, thousands of Tesla, this was done in the early days of ITC. I think nothing useful was actually obtained from that, but it uh, must have been a lot of fun you know, to <laughs> pr press a button and you, everything disappears. But if the software is good enough, you have recorded something on the way. So anyway, in these experiments, they can uh, repeat it and they didn't destroy the sample. They went up to uh, 180 Tesla. So they measured the one half plateau and the one-half plateau is also very broad. And here they didn't, re they didn't really measure, they didn't observe a two-fifths plateau that would be around here. There is some anomaly here, but at least they confirmed the, the, the plateaus. So that's the experimental side, at least as far as the mechanization is concerned. And uh, this raises a number of questions which are still to a larger extent open. The first question is, which plateaus are real? I, it, we, we, they, they cannot be all these plateaus, so one has to sort, sort it out properly and uh, this is uh, ongoing work and uh, uh, the big problem is that at these magnetic fields you cannot do any experiment you want. It's very difficult to do diffraction that would tell you exactly where the plateaus are, where the bright, peak uh, bright peaks are and uh, uh, so sure, sure enough some of these plateaus are not there. And the other question which is uh, 
even more difficult, and where maybe the community of ad atoms could help, is to know what the plateau structure is. Because what do we have access to some information. We know that the plateaus break the translational symmetry. And this is from NMR. So the first result was done copper NMR, done uh, in Grenoble but by Takigawa and collaborators, at for in, inside the 1 over 8 plateau. I will not go into too much detail, but this is the spectrum of copper outside the plateau where you expect to have one type of copper size. You have three, six overlapping lines because copper is a spin 3 half, the nuclear spin is 3 half, and you have two isotopes. But it's a typical spectrum of one copper, and by the time you reach, you go from 26 tesla below the 1 over 8 plateau to 27.6 tesla. The spectrum becomes much more complicated with many different lines corresponding to many copper sites. So very clearly there is a broken translational symmetry and subsequent experiments done in, uh, uh, for the boron spectrum, they are less specific, but they clearly show that there are regions where the spectrum has narrow lines and doesn't change, and all these plateaus have a broken symmetry. So the question really that is now uh, uh, posed is, what is the structure of these plateaus? And NMR gives you a histogram. So NMR tells you there are a number of spins with this magnetization, a number of spins with the smaller one, a number of spins with the magnetization down, but NMR doesn't tell you where they are. They just give you the number, the proportion of spins having this orientation. So it's a tricky game to try and reconstruct the structure from NMR. And uh, uh, scattering experiments are currently being done, but it's in pulse field, 30 tesla, so it's very difficult. But to give you an idea of the, 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 the kind of question we, we, that is posed in the field, for the 1 over 8 plateau, I think at the moment there are two well, there are several candidates, but two of them are, uh, are more likely f because of NMR. And these plateaus are very different in the structure. One of them would be a crystal of triplets. We put triplets here at different sides. The triplets polarize a little bit the surrounding, but this object here has essentially a spin one. And you make a crystal with this unit cell. Now, more recently, with the uh, collaborator, Philippe Corbeau, I think we have improved simulations and uh, we came up with the, uh, the proposal, the fact that this structure is actually not the lowest energy, but there is another structure, completely different, some kind of pinwheel, crystal of spin two bound states having this geometry. If you look at it, the number of up spins is essentially the same, so both structures will be at least uh, uh, at zeroth order compatible with NMR, but they are completely different. And this would be really, uh, it's, a, it's a real challenge to, de to determine these structures, the only hope at the moment is to, to do a, a neutron scattering or X-ray scattering in pulse field. But imagine depositing magnetic atoms on a surface in the Shastri, in the orthogonal dimer geometry, with coupling that are smaller in a field. If you see a plateau, you will have directly access to the structure in real space much more powerful from, than NMR from that point of view. I think we already had this discussion in the context of the spin one chain with edge states. NMR tell, gives you there is a distribution of spin, but it uh, doesn't tell you where they are. So th that's the kind of problem. It's a little bit science fiction at that stage. I understand it's not going to be tomorrow that uh, you're going to make this, but there are really questions where to have a real space imaging of a structure in two dimension would be extremely, extremely interesting. So I will stop here on 2D systems because uh, how much time do I have? When did I start? I start a little bit later than two more minutes. Two minutes? Ooh, I see. Oh, because it's okay. So let me give you a flavor of 1D I, 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 uh, because this was announced. So what is specific about 1D as compared to 2D and 3D? It's in 1D quantum fluctuations diverge, so you cannot have long range order. I think that was pointed out earlier in this conference. So you have no magnetic long range order, and there are two natural alternatives algebraic correlations or spin gap. And these al alternatives do not require frustration because quantum fluctuations are there even without frustration. So all half integer spin chains have algebraic correlations and all integer spin chains have a spin gap. I will not discuss this, I will skip it because of a lack of time because this has been discussed earlier this week. So I had slides for the spin one and a half Heisenberg, my own version of spin-ons and experimental realization and for the spin one Heisenberg chain where there is a simple valence bond uh, picture that was uh, put forward by Affleck and collaborators in 87. And uh, that was actually observed uh, experimentally in the 80s. Now, frustration brings new physics. And one of the aspects that would also be, that still 
is still waiting for an experimental confirmation, but it's a very old prediction. This is the first non-trivial paper on frustrated quantum magnetism, Majum Darin Ghosh, 1969. They looked at the J1, J2 Heisenberg chain, and they realized that for the value of the coupling constant J2 equals J1 over 2, there is an exactly dimerized ground state. That is, again, if you put a product of dimers on all the bonds in one direction, or on all the bonds in the other direction, you build a ground state of the system. The idea is always the same. If you put a bond here, this bond is like two J2 bonds, morally it's the same. And so the, the couplings here vanish because this is a spin zero, the couplings here vanish because this is a spin zero, etc. So it's, a, it's an eigenstate and it turns out to be the ground state. So this means that if we were to look at such a system, we would expect the ground state on a finite chain, for instance, if you had a chain like this, you would put dimers here and no dimer here. Now, I thought about it in the context of this conference and it's not completely obvious to me how this is going to show up in uh, 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 STM experiments. Because all atoms are equivalent. They're all non-magnetic in principle and they all participate into a singlet, this one into a singlet here, this one into a singlet here. But still, there, there could be two effects that uh, would lead to some measurable effect. First of all, if we have strong bonds here, maybe the system is going to distort a little bit to take advantage of the strong bond here to gain more energy so that one would see in real space some distortion corresponding to the spontaneous dimerization. In bulk system, this is actually supposed to be a very strong effect. Yes? What well, I don't understand when you uh, give this argument so about the um, basically uh, translation invariance, right? So, but in the experiment, what they have always finite chains. Yes. Yes, so you would see one of the ground states. This is what I was saying. If you have such a system here, you, you will not see, if you were to build the ground state like this here, you would have these three spins, you would lack one coupling, and this would be a higher energy state. So on a finite system, unless you make it uh, un unless you make a David star, which is like one of these systems with periodic boundary condition where the two ground states remain, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a system like this, finite system, you would favor one state. Now, if you were to have an odd number of sides, then it's more complicated because you will have free spins, but it, it, it could propagate, and then the ground state would be, uh, okay, you would have a spectrum of low lying excitations in that system. So, I I'm giving you the, uh, the flavor of the thing, but... Uh, but so in, in principle you have this. But now if you have a singlet of this on this bond and no singlet on this bond and the singlet here. So one possibility is that you have stronger bond. The other possibility, but I, I don't know if it, is, it really makes sense, it, would, it should be uh, uh, checked more carefully, but we, if we have exchange here, we have electrons going back and forth here and back and forth here, but no electron here. So still the tunneling current by moving the, uh, the tip from one atom to the other should reflect something of di this dimerization, it seems to me, but this should be worked out. I'm not completely sure about that. It's, um, well, it's uh, almost real-time physics. I thought about it when preparing this talk here. So anyway, for spin one-half, we have a, uh, the spin one-half chain is gapless. It's uh, algebraic correlation, and there is uh, an exactly dimerized point here, but there is a dimerization transition here at a ratio which is 0 0.2411, etc. And, uh, uh, there is maybe an experimental realization in solid state, but it's not clear because it's uh, 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 a spin. It could also be a spin. It's a spin pi. Also, we don't know whether frustration is essential, and it would be interesting to probe. There is a general relation to li large spin. This is my own work. It's a pity, but I will skip it. <laughs> Just to say, I want to make a connection. One minute to make connection with the work by uh, Stefan uh, Blügel. So, if you uh, um, if you try to generalize the uh, the physics for spin larger than uh, spin one half, the J1, J2 model doesn't do it. The argument that these wave functions are eigenstates still apply, but they are not the ground states. And if you want to build a Hamiltonian with simple means, you have to build very complicated Hamiltonians, Klein model, not realistic at all. So in fact, to make it realistic, one has to go back to physics, and this is what was discussed earlier by Stefan Blügel. If you take a spin one system to derive the Heisenberg model, one should start with two orbitals, a Hubbard model with two orbitals per side. And then the nearest neighbor coupling shows up in perturbation theory to order t squared over u. But then to next order, we have three types of couplings. Next nearest neighbor coupling, it doesn't do the job. By quadratic coupling, it does do the job, but for a very large coupling. But there is another coupling here, J3, 
which is actually the equivalent of the uh, 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 next nearest neighbor coupling. So I will skip the phase diagram with bacteriotic interaction, so there is a lot of interesting things to be said there. And uh, I will come to the last slide before the conclusion, that even for larger spins, because when you put atoms, I understand that very often you're going to put atoms with a larger spin than spin one half, one can still expect to see this physics. It would require the effective interaction to contain the three side term, which is allowed by, by symmetry. But if this term takes this value, again, we have an exactly dimerized ground state. This is what we show. This is really a generalization of the majunov gauche results. And more generally, we have a phase diagram in the system where we have a dimerized phase and a non-dimerized phase that is separated by a phase transition. And this phase transition turns out to be uh, an exotic criticality, which is the Vesumino uh, uh, Witten model level k over 2, which means some specific critical exponents that could in principle be measured experimentally. And uh, I will skip this, I will skip this, and I come to the conclusion that uh, I hope I, I, I gave you a flavor of what uh, we in the, in the community of quantum magnetism believe that frustration brings a lot of new physics. New exciting, difficult, it's, these are difficult problems for theorists and difficult for people trying to synthesize materials. But we are looking for quantum spin liquids. We have observed magnetization plateaus that are still very puzzling. Spontaneous dimerization or uh, tra translational symmetry breaking is uh, everywhere. And uh, uh, in the context of the uh, physics of ad atoms, there are at least two important things that have to be further explored before we can really make contact between our communities. The first one is, to study the combined effect of frustration and anisotropy. Take a more realistic model of what could be the interaction between magnetic atoms and uh, put frustration and see whether wh what remains or whether maybe new effects show up. And the other thing is a way to probe exotic states, which is not uh, uh, obvious, but certainly possible. Okay, thank you for your attention. <laughs>